why don't you want to go back? And he won't. He wouldn't tell me. He didn't say why. He was just like, I just, I just don't want to go back. And it's, and now I'm finding out a lot of this stuff. And it's, I wish you had told me. A um, little bit later, I wound up going to bed. And um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. Hello and welcome to my channel. Thank you all so much for joining me. I'm so glad to have you here. Now in this episode, we're going to talk about the case of the missing 15 year old, Sebastian Rogers and Sebastian is autistic. Now it was said that he is high functioning, but after that it came out that he does have some special needs and he also does require some kind of medication. So what exactly is going on here? Sebastian was reported missing on Monday, February the 26th. And what happened was the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation issued an endangered child alert at approximately 11.17 a.m. in the morning on behalf of the Sumner County Sheriff's Office. In the alert, investigators wrote that Sebastian was last seen earlier that day near Stafford Court in Hendersonville. And that is where Sebastian lived with his mother and his stepdad, Chris Proudfoot. Now, this is a very serious situation because, like I said, Sebastian has special needs. And if by chance he did walk away from his home, as his mother said, then he's in danger and definitely needs help. The area where Sebastian lives, you'll notice that it is surrounded by water, and that is Hendersonville, Tennessee. There's water all around the area. Of course, there have been many searches for Sebastian since he went missing, and that is more than a month that he has been out missing. Either he's with someone, if he left by himself to meet someone, maybe somebody has him, or worst case scenario, he's no longer alive. And this is more of a recovery search that is happening. But we don't know at this point. Now, there has been a lot of suspicion on Sebastian's parents, on the mother and on Chris Proudfoot, people have been very suspicious of what they had to say very early on. Their first interview, and then they did another interview after that where we only got to see the couple's hands, which is very strange that they would want to have an interview only showing their hands. And from there, suspicions continued on. People just didn't take a liking to the parents wondering exactly what happened. It simply didn't look good what we were hearing. We have absolutely no evidence to support foul play. Not cleared anyone, but we have absolutely no evidence to support foul play. I asked about exclusive home security video obtained from the neighborhood the night Sebastian disappeared. You can see two suspicious light sources, which we've circled here in an area behind the teen's home. Since we first aired the video last month, authorities have said... No evidentiary value? It is of no evidentiary value. Can you tell me what those lights are? No. Why? Because the investigation remains ongoing. And so it could play a role down the road depending on developments? We don't know what we don't know. So yes, it could play a role. Sebastian also has another parent. He has a father, his birth father, who is Seth Rogers. Seth has been out there on foot looking for his son 
every day along with the search teams and he is asking for help to find his son. And it seems that he does hold on to hope that Sebastian might have actually left on his own and that maybe he's still alive, that he's possibly with someone and that he has not reached out to his father, but his father says that he wants Sebastian to reach out to him if by chance he hears one of the many reports that are happening here on YouTube and all over the news. So hopefully if he is alive, he will be able to. So here we have the landscape where Sebastian was living with his mother. And I was very concerned when I saw this because here, as you can see, this is Hendersonville. And it's literally surrounded by water. And they say that these kids, these autistic kids, for some reason, they are drawn towards water. I guess there's some kind of fascination where they want to be close to the water. They want to touch the water as they get closer and closer. You know, there's that danger of falling in and losing control. So hopefully if he did leave the house, then he left more and stayed on dry land. So let me know what you all think. What have you heard? Is there still a chance for Sebastian that he might be alive? Now, like I said, it's been over a month of time that he's been gone. And so how exactly is he going to survive the elements if he was out in the wild? If it is as his mother said that he left the house. Now, I don't quite understand because they say he left and that everything was locked. There is no sign of an intruder. There was no break-in. There's no recording of him leaving, yet they do have a recording of Sebastian when he takes out the garbage. So they can, they do have that technology there by his house to show a recording of Sebastian when he goes to take out the garbage. But unfortunately, there's nothing to show when he left, as the mother said, that he left the house. So that is very strange. Why is it that in these cases with these missing kids, there's never any recording of them walking away? So here it is. This is where Sebastian lived. And I'm sure all of you know that there was the construction site very close behind where his house is. Now here is his house. And this is a gorgeous neighborhood. These are very large houses. It's a very clean neighborhood, manicured lawns. Look at that. Look at how tidy it is. And um, I would imagine that these, are the, these homes have very good security systems, cameras, all of that stuff. Now here with Sebastian's house, and there's a covering in the front of trees. So that is not optimal. From this side, this is his driveway, and you can see here the garage. There's like a double garage and a single garage, and there are lights here above the garages. There's lights. There's a garbage. You can see right there. He has an area here. Their yard is fenced. You can see there's a black painted iron gate fence here. Uh, surrounding his yard but then this area here is not not fenced okay and so here is the front of his house there's the mailbox and let's have a look from this side there it is that's his house that is the front door uh, there's some steps there at the front door also very tidy they have here a little bit of landscaping with mulching. And let's have a look here at the other side. You can kind of see, once again on this side, it's covered with trees as well. And so that would not really be helpful at night if somebody had a camera pointing over here. That would make it more difficult uh, to have the visibility 
to see him, you know, if he was out there at night. But there is that fence, that um, steel iron or whatever that is. And there's a door here, a white door, which is not behind the fence. So this is all very strange. I really don't understand how this can happen in a neighborhood like this. If he came up from the front, he's going to be seen by one of these homes. Check out this place here. You know, it's this one is very tidy. There's no trees around this home, which is different from Sebastian's home. But does this home have a camera? I'm guessing that there's got to be cameras for these homes. Look at this place. That looks like a doorbell camera right there. I'm guessing that's what that is. And so how does Sebastian get away from here without being seen on camera? It's very strange. Now we found out that Sebastian's mom, Katie, she actually keeps her vehicle in the garage. So if she was to get into her garage from inside the house, she would get in, she would enter her vehicle, put in whatever it is into her vehicle, and then exit out. As opposed to having her vehicle parked in this driveway and then you know, coming out and getting into the vehicle. She gets in from inside of the garage. And that is another interesting thought to keep in mind. Now, they say that Sebastian was last seen wearing a black sweatshirt and black sweatpants and glasses. This is what I've heard. But I also heard another report saying that he was wearing jeans. Okay, so I'm not sure why it is that um, that was put out there. They say close to a dozen agencies, including the TBI, the Tennessee Highway Patrol, the Nashville Fire Department, the City of Hendersonville's first responders, Sumner County Sheriff's Office, and Shackle Island Volunteer Fire all began searching for Sebastian on Monday, February 26th. And so this is not one of those cases where someone is missing, for example, for two or three days or for a week, you know, where there's a lot of time where they, they might have, you know, gotten away. But this is very soon when the report was made and they started looking for him right away. Now, I know that Sebastian's stepdad, people have taken <laughs> a great dislike towards him. He comes off as, as being quite, uh, how can I put this, um, unaware. He says things which really turn people against him. Worse than that, now one of his ex-wives has come out and she has recounted the relationship in tears of what happened to her, you know, through the court and the fight for her daughter, for her baby that she didn't get to see. It's heart-wrenching what happened. But still, does that mean that uh, he has something to do with it? No, we can't really say that he did. And he says that he was at work. But of course, people don't work dark at night. He's a crane operator. And so that is one of the jobs where you can't really be out there in the dark operating the crane. Also, they normally don't work in bad weather. If there's a storm, if it's raining, then it's not safe. I really don't understand why he had been away so long. The drive taking about three hours, and then you'd think he would be able to come home for the weekend. Now, I did hear that he and Sebastian's mother were possibly having a split, possibly. And so that would explain why he was away so often. Also, this man has been married five times. And so being away makes me think it's kind of convenient if you're starting another relationship or ending one. Anyhow, we don't know what that has to do with it. But regardless, at this point in time, the most important thing is to search for Sebastian. 
We're out here right now searching for Sebastian Rogers. We have the TBI and Nashville's Office of Emergency Management here, along with Hendersonville, Smyrna, and Rutherford emergency crews. They've been searching around homes off of Long Hollow Pike near Shackle Island, where investigators say Sebastian was last seen weeks ago. I've been told search crews have not found any evidence or trace of Sebastian yet, but they plan on searching for the next couple of days. Their command center is set up right here at Long Hollow Church. If this is a foul play situation, I suppose that will come to light with time. But the thing that kind of worries me is if he did not leave by himself on foot, then he might not be in that surrounding area, that he might be a lot further away. If he has been taken away in a vehicle, is what I mean. If Sebastian had been put into a vehicle and driven out of the area, then these searches are going to be fruitless. They will be searching without finding a trail. And so that is the part that kind of has me thinking that uh, when you have a child who is a special need child, like for example, Sebastian, he is not going to be very conniving. There's kind of an innocence that they have with the autistic kids that I've seen, they can be very particular with their routine. And there was one that I knew um, who was a neighbor, and I, I noticed that he wanted to have certain things. If he was going out, wherever he was going with his parents, he would want to have, for example, a toy with him, a backpack along before he would leave for his ride. And so these are as for some reason, they need that comfort, that routine, that that exact thing every time. And I suppose that keeps them on track. And so for that reason, I'm thinking that Sebastian would not leave the house. If it were true that he'd left on his own, then he would have taken either a backpack, he would have taken his phone, his shoes, I don't believe that an autistic child would leave without shoes. I have never seen that. I've seen that they're very picky with the details that he would be definitely putting on his shoes. That is my own observation of what I've seen. But who knows? Now, I know that his father, Seth, did give an example of why Sebastian would be wearing shoes. And he said that Sebastian had had an incident once where he was outside, I think in his socks or without shoes, and that there were some ants, uh, some of those uh, stinging fire ants, I believe it was. And so after that, he always had to have his socks and shoes on when he went outside. And so I really don't see him leaving that house on his own without shoes. Of course, there's the other issue of medication. They say that Sebastian requires medication. I don't know what kind it is, if it's something to keep him calm, if it's something more to do with, um, I did hear that he has some sort of um, water on the side of his brain, something like that. I don't know what kind of medication it is that he requires, but I doubt that he would have taken that with him. That's probably something where the parent has to give that to him whenever he needs it. And so how is that going to affect him? Can he survive? The thing is, if he doesn't have that medication, is it kind of where it's something where it's life-threatening that he doesn't have the medication? Is he going to, like some of these kids could have other health issues alongside their autism. And some of them have epilepsy. Some of these kids need to wear a helmet. You know, does he have epilepsy? Is it that kind of a medication? So we really don't know at this point, but that is very concerning as well. They have continued to ask residents to check their yards if they have an area where someone could, you know, hide out like a shed, something like that, have a look and see if not only if he's there, but if anything looks like it's been moved, possibly something left behind, it could be a trail to show where Sebastian has been. So on February 27th, which is the Tuesday, the next day, the TBI issued an Amber Alert on the next day. I wonder why they waited 
Supposedly, they received information which made them decide to put up that Amber Alert. And that happened at around 3.25 p.m. when officials said the decision to upgrade the alert was based on additional investigative information developed during the search. So I wonder if that was a vehicle which was seen recorded possibly on a security camera. And for that reason, they decided to uh, upgrade this to an Amber Alert. But as I said, for some reason, on the Tuesday at 3.25 p.m., that is when they decided to do that. By February 27th, searchers had covered 2,000 miles on foot and went through Sebastian's home multiple times. In the press conference, authorities continued to urge residents to check their surveillance cameras and report any possible information that could help lead to Sebastian. On Saturday, March 2nd, a reward was offered for information. As the search for Sebastian entered its sixth day, officials stated that there still had been no sightings. The Sheriff's Office told News 2 an anonymous group of business owners in the Nashville area had pledged a minimum cash reward of $3,000 for information. On Sunday, March 3rd, Sebastian's mother and stepfather speak out. The reward for information was raised to 3500 on Sunday, March 3rd. Sebastian's mother and stepfather also spoke publicly for the first time that day, telling a podcast host more details about his disappearance. All right, so March 3rd. Now, this happened on the Monday. September the 26th, okay? So they kind of did wait for a while before talking publicly. Now let's have a listen to what Sebastian's mother and stepfather had to say. I want to look very closely at that interview. Now you might have noticed here on YouTube, we have many YouTubers who are actually professional. And for example, we have Peter Hyatt, as well as others who profile who are investigative detectives, all kinds of stuff here. And they are very suspicious of the mom and the stepdad. And there was an analysis done by Peter Hyatt. There was, I think, two or three times that he came out. And it doesn't look good from what he's saying, from the words that he has analyzed coming from the mom and the stepdad. It's really not good at all. Okay, and we have Nancy Grace, as well as many others who also uh, came out very early saying that they had their suspicions on the mom and on the stepdad. Very soon, they came out with that. Now, interestingly, we have the same group of people, the professionals, who are saying that YouTubers are doing a disservice to these cases by our theories and our speculation. But it's funny that they then go on to make the exact same speculations, the same conversations, the same analysis, bringing up the same points that all of us are thinking and questioning. But we have a right to think. We have a right to have an opinion as long as we're not hindering the investigation. As long as we are not putting fake things out, we are questioning what we see, but not um, standing in the way of the investigation, not getting too close and not making calls to this investigative team, making calls for things that are, for example, a dream you had, um, you know, just your own little theory if you have something which is concrete, you know, a sighting, if you have a sighting of Sebastian, if you have a recording of Sebastian, if you spotted him somewhere, that is the kind of stuff they want, but not something which, you know, just a figment of your imagination, not our conversations here, not our brainstorming. They don't need that because they have their own think tank. They've got the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation working on this and they have enough professionals working on it. So 
the way I see it, we have the right to continue on our conversation here. We want answers. We are nitpicking and on every last thing, trying to figure out exactly what happened. Basically, uh, getting every single piece of the puzzle and trying to fit it together. And when that piece doesn't fit, when there's a piece or, or something that is said, which just contradicts, which will not fit in, then you got to probe, right? And so let's have a listen and let me know what all of you think as we listen together here. I'm into your home um, to talk with you all. Um, obviously, everyone wants to hear what you have to say. And it's all about bringing Sebastian home and safely. So first, just express, I can't even imagine as a parent what you two are going through. How would you describe the situation right now? How are you coping? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> We're on a constant roller coaster ride of helpless and hopeless and many other emotions all in one and it's a never ending roller coaster. It doesn't stop. It won't stop until he walks through the door. Okay, first thing, pretty obvious, we see here that the mom is constantly swaying back and forth, and she tends to keep looking straight down forward, but I don't really know how to take that, if it's kind of like a self-soothing, if my sense of it is that she knows something that she's not saying, yet at the same time, we haven't been told anything as far as this stepdad. It hasn't been confirmed either way, if he was at work or not. Now, let me know what you think about the laugh when Chris talks. He is going to laugh about Sebastian returning and having all the friends, everyone come by and see him. That seems really out of place. Uh, doesn't belong and I mean, how can you laugh when you have a child who has pretty much just vanished in the night and there is no trace of him and he has special needs? I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Not anyone. I know we're about keeping hope alive. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. Come home. He's gonna walk through that door, <laughs> and this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And that boy's gonna have more friends than he knows what to do with <laughs> when he comes home. <laughs> all right. So the interviewer had prompted them about keeping hope alive, and that is when. Uh, Chris and Katie, that is when they went on and said, you know, when he gets home. And that's when uh, Chris laughed, you know, but he overdid it. It was too much. You know, he giggled and he giggled twice. And so I think that um, it just doesn't really fit in. Let me know what you guys see when, when they make light of this situation. And you know, he has been missing now you know, a week. And so how does that fit in with the time frame? Making a joke. Making a joke at this point in time. Let me know what you think. So here we are, eight days now searching for him. Walk us through that Sunday night that he went missing. So walk us through. We've got so many people who really want to know, okay, how did this happen? So kind of just walk us through that night. Um, we were out and about that day. We were having a really good weekend. Um, we got home. Uh, everything was pretty normal. He was playing in his room. Um, when I told him to go to bed. All right, so I already watched this, but I noticed something when Katie is talking. I would say, look at Chris. Watch his face when she's talking. And then when she says that he wasn't there, look at Chris's throat. 
he does a big gulp at that point in time. It just seems very heavy. They take a pause and it just seems very awkward. Comment down below. Let me know what do you see? Is there something more to this? What are they hiding? Is Does he know more? Where was he when all of this happened? He did. <laughs> um, he said goodnight, Mom. I love you. Um, Say goodnight to his puppies. A um, little bit later, I wound up going to bed. And um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. A um, little bit later, I wound up going to bed. And um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. So in your mind, that's usually around what time? When do you normally wake up? Around 6 o'clock? So were you instantly thinking something's wrong? Or were you like, he may just be already in the shower, in the living room? I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take. I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. Um, he said, what do you mean you can't find him? I said, he's not in the house. And so at that point, is that when you call 911? Or what's going through your mind? She, while we were on the phone, and I was asked, like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, The normal places he may be in the house, you know? And, he wasn't. So I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department and made the report. I and ran all over the house, outside, inside. I looked in every closet. So has it come out, basically, the bed? Has it come out whether or not Sebastian's bed had been used that night? Did she notice that um, anything was, let's say, used out of place? That maybe he had uh, taken some things out of his drawers or like anything? Did she notice anything which would tell her that he left? Did he just up and leave? I mean, does, does an autistic child just get up and leave without their shoes, just with a flashlight and that's it. Um, it doesn't really make sense. If he had been planning to take off, then you'd think he would have taken his shoes with him. But these parents are saying that the only thing missing is a flashlight. So how is it that they notice so quickly that a flashlight is missing is also interesting because a lot of the times you've got a flashlight and you might have more than one and it's, you know, sitting in a drawer or you don't use it quite often. Is that light something that Sebastian was using all the time? Was that one of his favorite things? You know, and um, what else? There's got to be more to this. If he had taken off on his own, was his bedroom door open? Was, you know, they're saying that there's no sign of anything, that the door was locked. So... It just doesn't really make sense. And these kids are not very conniving. They're not able to keep a secret. There would have been hints. If he had been planning to take off, he probably would have been, you know, giving off some kind of a hint that he was unhappy, either with her or with the stepdad. There would have been something to tell, to, to give some prior notice as to what he was planning on doing. And we haven't heard them say anything about that. She keeps saying that everything was fine. Within minutes, they were here. They responded within minutes, and here we go. So you said you were on the phone with her. So you were not home. No, ma'am. Okay. I was. I was at work. I'm a tower crane operator, and I was working in Memphis at the St. Jude Project. So it's, you know. I have an earpiece in that talks to my phone. I have another earpiece in that does the radios. So when she was talking to me, I was like, what? I was confused. We talked about where he could possibly be. And then we went from there and led to calling the cops. And here we are now. And within minutes, they're there at the home. Yes, ma'am. All right. So it's a Monday morning. 
He's working as a crane operator for St. Jude's in Memphis, 6 a.m. in the morning. I suppose that we're supposed to believe that he's at work. He's got his earpiece in, uh, meaning that he's at work, I suppose, in his crane. Is there like, is there any kind of proof of when he actually started working that day? What was he doing the night before? Did he arrive at work, for example, for some reason? Did he arrive at 5 in the morning? What is this guy's regular routine? What is his work schedule? I know that these crane operators, they have a very specialized job and they need to have uh, certain things prepared uh, below uh, on the work site and then they often have to wait while they're working for things to be done um, and then they proceed along with their part of the job but like when is when is his shift um, what was he doing on Sunday what exactly was he doing because when he was asked by Nancy Grace about when he had last been there it's not very clear exactly when he did visit the home and I just, I have to still wonder, like, if he had maybe been there, if he had gone over that night, had he been there on Sunday for some reason. So it's, um, there's no confirmation. Law enforcement has not come out and said, hey, this guy was not there. He has a rock solid alibi. I haven't heard any such thing. And so it's still open to question until they can come out and say listen he has an alibi you know and that is the best thing for them to do because as it is now that question is wide open it was rapid fire they had cars they, they had cars from here down to the to the main road, road as far as i could tell so what's going through both of your minds? I mean, are we panicking? Is it this, oh, I think he's probably at a neighbor's house or what are you thinking? My son doesn't run, he's not a runner. He's never run away before. Um, I don't know why. He, I don't know why he walked out that door. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. I mean, he's a good kid. He's not, he's not a mischievous child by any means. Um, but there's answers to questions that have no answers, you know, or questions, excuse me, questions with no answers right now that we are searching for desperately and we just don't have that. Is there anything that happened that day that you think back and th there might have been a reason he was possibly upset or something outside that could have enticed him to go outside? Was there anything that came to mind? We've been combing over that day and even the weeks before he left and I don't, I haven't been able to figure it out. He's, um, that morning he was laughing, he was joking. Everyone we were around that day agreed that he seemed like he was in a good mood. He was behaving. It'd make more sense if we'd been fighting. Or he'd been in trouble, but he hadn't been in trouble. <laughs> so, I mean, a, the million dollar question, why did he go? And the other million dollar question is how? What about social media? Was there anything that you know, anyone he could have contacted. I understand he was somewhat of a gamer or what was he, there was a video game he loved, right? <laughs> Minecraft, yeah. he loves Minecraft. Um, the, the game that he has is not online. He has the, the um, Switch. Um, he's, we don't, because of how social media can be, he doesn't have accessibility to communicate with folks on the internet. On internet. I mean, I we have a firm belief that we just don't feel that right now that he's capable of having that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he 
his phone is locked down, his computers, his game. He doesn't have a gamer tag. He doesn't have online capabilities with games. Um, I mean, we've, it, um, we've combed every electronic, every electronic. I mean, we've cooperated with all the authorities as far as anything they've asked us to provide. We've provided and still just don't have any answers. Well, that's a very important part of this case and of every case these days, and that is the electronics. And she said, the mom just said that they have combed through all of their his electronics. Now, I'm wondering, because he has that switch, I wonder if they're able to go in and see how late he was up playing with the switch. Does it show the time exactly let's say that day, what time did he play that game? Was he up late into the night? Is there proof to show that he had been playing that game, let's say until 10, 10, 30, 11? Is there anything on his device, on his cell phone, which would show that he had been using his cell phone? Anything, anything to prove, you know, what time he was actually there. So of course the investigators do have that. I believe they had taken everything and have gone over it and I'm thinking that it's going to be very helpful. Now let me know what you all think about that. Do you have any thoughts to add in as far as they say he didn't have any social media but still uh, he has electronics. Now he had a cell phone and what I heard was that it was left at home. There's got to be something, some clue that will show either that he had a plan that something had changed in his regular routine, that it can prove that he was there. You know, what if he hadn't used that switch all of Sunday? Or let's say he stopped using it at maybe five and normally he would be playing, let's say between five and seven, whatever, maybe his normal routine is to be on that. And on Sunday, he didn't. And that might be quite significant. Did he have any friends that could have possibly contacted him in some way on his phone? All his friends at school have been questioned to my knowledge and none of them knew anything. So this big question mark, he's vanished. Yes, and no one can figure out where or why. Um, all right, so Let's talk to you about the relationship involved because they're, the biological father is very much involved in Sebastian's life as well. Yes, ma'am, very is. much. Right? Um, and, and how would you describe that relationship, the two of them and the four of you? It's relatively good. I mean, we talk regularly. He talks to his son on a regular basis, sees him on a regular basis. He's involved in school and therapy and... Um, I mean, he doesn't have any extracurricular activities, but I can tell you now, if he did, he'd, his dad would be in the front row. <laughs> um, in two different households. And the communication between the three of us is, is great. I mean, yes, we're just like every parent. We all have our disagreements, but in the end, we come together as a team and we work and we come up with solutions. Well, he just said that the communication between him and uh, Sebastian's dad, Seth Rogers, is great. But to hear it from Seth Rogers, he says that these two haven't talked to him ever since this whole thing happened, that they're not talking. So what kind of communication is that? You would think if this happened, then that would pull them together, that they would unite in order to find Sebastian. So I don't really see why he just said that. Why is he saying that their communication is so good? This is really confusing. Um, either he's lying or he this guy is just totally out of the loop. He just kind of talks and uh, says whatever without any meaning. So let me know what you all think about that. that as we best see fit. I mean, he's I'm almost in contact with him almost daily. Um, let's talk about Sebastian. Tell me about Sebastian. How would you describe him? Sweet, stubborn. <laughs> um, he loves to help. He loves uh, 
running and he loves to play his games and his fidgets and um, Uno. Lord, that's one of his favorite games right now. Um, favorite color is green. Um, Does he love music? Oh, God, oh. he loves music. An eclectic taste. I mean, An eclectic. I mean, from, as, as everybody knows, Eye of the Tiger to Eddie Vedder. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we got we got Pearl Jam on one hand. We've got Survivor on the other over here. We've got Taylor Swift and uh, he's got a big crush on her. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, country rock. No hip hop. We don't we don't allow the hip hop. Well, he, he doesn't really well, get I into it anyways. Things. We, you mentioned he loved running, so. Did he love the outdoors at all? I mean, would something outside that was somewhat outdoorsy be enticing so, to him or pull him outdoors? He loves, like, when, um, when we were in California and the school had this lap thing to gain money. It was a fundraiser. And every year he was, I did this many laps, I did this many laps. I mean, I've got t-shirts where they would write on his back. Every time the kids went around, they'd mark a mark on the back and they'd keep running. And he just had marks all the way across his back. Um, he likes playgrounds. Um, he hates oh, yeah. being dirty. He, he don't like being, being dirty. dirty. Yeah, he's not, a, he's not your tomboy style child where he goes outside and plays in the mud. He loves animals, but he's terrified <laughs> of bugs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, yeah. even a fly, and he's like, oh! <laughs> and, um... So, there you can hear the parents talking about Sebastian. He hates to get dirty. He hates bugs. And she just showed you when, you know, how he gets scared, even of a fly. So, just imagine Sebastian outside in the wilderness with dirt, water, mud, all kinds of flies and whatever else, birds. How is he going to survive out there like that now that we hear from her? And that is exactly what I was thinking from what I've seen. The few uh, autistic children that I've seen, they are more sensitive towards certain things certain uh, stimuli, even noises, might get under their skin. So I really find this eye-opening, but it's another big problem. He is scared of mosquitoes. He's scared of flies. He's scared of insects. He's scared to get dirty. So of course, he's going to wear his shoes. That goes against him deciding to go out and explore. So it just goes against the whole story. Let me know what you all think. Let's talk too because he's highly functioning. I know you all have described him as having a form of autism. He does. But des describe that to our viewers too as far as his way of thinking of things and maybe how determined he was about certain things or his mindset. He, um... <laughs> he, he's got a stubborn mindset. If he believes it's this, he gets on a one-man track, and he is just yeah. on it, and he is all about it. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he's he's very smart. He's I mean, he, he can play chess. He, he can beat adults in chess, wow. and he's... Okay. He loves, he loves, loves, loves playing games. What about navigation? Like, did he have a sense of direction? Do you think he could have possibly even hitched a ride or gotten a ride on a bus or some sort of transportation that is a speculation that we don't have an answer for just I directionally mean, he knows he could guide you from our house to his dad's house yeah he could get from like this house i think he can make it up to culver's ice cream he can go to culver's oh, that boy loves he knows malt. where culver's <laughs> is because culver's has malt uh -huh. he loves malt extra malt every yeah. time extra malt now, how far away does his dad live? Clarksville. His dad lives up by Clarksville. So he could guide someone all the way to Clarksville? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh, wow. Okay. So a pretty keen sense of direction, at least with certain things. 
if, familiar routes. Yes. Familiar routes. Okay. Familiar routes. I mean, if I took him another route going he this way, he would it. not know it. Mm. He goes up there so often that he yes. knows he knows how to get to his right. daddy's. We know that. His dad works with him as far as, oh, we're going this way, we're going that way, and mm -hmm. keeps the same thing, and it works out. Mm -hmm. So, um, Let's talk, too, because earlier, Chris, you and I were talking, and you were saying that there are a lot of people who are harassing both of you. What of any of that do you want to address? What, what do you want to say to any of these people? Just that... You don't know, and I don't wish you to ever know. I would say it like this. Everybody has an opinion, you know, it, and it's perfectly okay to have that opinion, but you're not in this situation. You don't quite understand. Um, I wish people would step back, take a different wide open view, and not assume what they know. It's just better to stick to the facts. If they have questions, all they have to do is ask. And I pray genuinely that no one ever goes through this. Just be kind to people. I mean, that's, that's real simple. There are some people who have been talking, because I know this is part of the harassment. Um, is there anything you want to address about this child custody situation <laughs> with the previous. So I have a, a current case. So we have heard the interview with the ex with this child custody battle and that woman was in tears for what she had to go through. Now he was laughing uh, just now about it, but she didn't laugh. She, contrasting to that, she was having a horrible time, uh, what she went through just to have her child. That uh, she was saying she was in court and she couldn't hug or kiss the baby. Uh, it was horrible. He said to people to be kind, but I just couldn't help but think about what that woman had gone through. So... It's um, it's not a good look. This child custody situation <laughs> with the previous. So I have a, a current case that is going ongoing in another state. Um, we've requested that case to be sealed because there are some individuals who have taken it upon themselves to put stuff out there that they don't quite know, which all they have to do is ask. I'll tell you. Um, but because of that, you know, it has nothing to do with our son. It has nothing to do with the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I just, people would respect that and, and keep an open mind. It's mm -hmm. totally different. If Sebastian is able to watch this and maybe he's watching this as it airs, and if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh gosh, that we love you so much and we want you to come home and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you he is loved. And trust me, the open arms are waiting for him to come home from every parent to every family members to probably everyone in the community. But there's no malice. So we just want our boy home. Bad. Bad. But. That mama's heart. I know it's daddy's too. But I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. <laughs> Let's talk about the community because I want you all to know, even, even my church body, I mean, we're all praying. We're all praying for his safe return. 
quickly. What do you all want to say to the community? Thank you. With everything from the bottom of our hearts. We, I would not have imagined how far this has gotten, but there's no way to repay the gratitude, the love that we've felt from the community, the prayers, but thank you. But from don't the stop looking. Yeah, please. My son is somewhere. This ain't over until he's home. That's right. So we have, let's, let's mention, let's hit on the, the search itself because we know thousands of miles have basically been traced and retraced. We've got hundreds, we've got volunteers, we've got law enforcement from within the state, from without, you know, outside of the state. Um, I mean, do you feel like they're doing as much as they can? I mean, you, you've been, you all have been right there in the front seat seeing everything that's that's underway as far as i know they're doing everything anything and everything has been an option they have brought in assets and resources from various counties potentially other states i mean i don't know how much more they could do yeah. but we're grateful for everything they have done they're amazing but they still haven't brought my baby back they will He's out there somewhere. So it's basically, it's one day at a time, getting through this and bringing him home. What is the reaction to the fact that somehow he, his, his image, he hasn't been captured on any video anywhere? I know that it was very dark that night. I mean, it gets dark around here at night in general, but um, so far, we haven't found him on any camera footage to prove where he's at or where he's gone. I know that they're looking, and I'm asking everybody and anybody that has cameras, trail cams, mm -hmm. stores, um, <clears throat> to check even from before he went missing just to see if there's anything at all. And I understand there, there was a request for video, any sort of footage of Sebastian from earlier in the day, on Sunday, before he disappeared? That I don't believe we can comment on right now. I don't, that is not something that I believe we're pervy to at this point with law enforcement. That is something I would, I would definitely direct back to them. But, I mean, they, there's all kinds of requests out there. There's thousands of hours of video that they are combing and we're just hoping they'll find something. And I know this is so sensitive. What do you say to people who inevitably end up pointing their finger back at you? We were talking earlier and I mean, are you both in the clear? I can tell you that mom, myself and the father have worked very fully and cooperatively with all agencies across the board. We have anything that they've wanted, we have provided. Um, so cooperation is there. I mean, What do you want to say to our viewers? Anybody who's watching, we've got a lot of folks in this community and in other counties just throughout the state as well. What do you want to say to them? Help spread the word and keep searching and thank you. And um, just if you think you see him, call him in. Thank all the viewers, everybody that's helped from across the board. I mean, everybody has been tremendous. Call his name. Yeah. He'll answer. And if he doesn't answer, he'll at least, he'll look. Even if he's not being verbal at the moment because he can talk but sometimes he don't talk. <laughs> um, call his name, tell him to stay put. And he could be on the move, so keep checking your properties. Yes, I, the search is never over until he comes home. That is He's for sure. so smart. But thank you for everything that everybody has done, has volunteered, uh, the continuous efforts, I mean, it's, like I said, this is, I've never seen something to this magnitude before. 
Our community is amazing. We're all praying, hoping, and searching for Sebastian's safe return for that day. Thank you both for talking with me. Well, it has been 35 days now since Sebastian went missing. We are finding out there's the possibility that he didn't want to go back home. There is information coming out which is not good having to do with this stepfather. A lot of it is just gossip and rumors. The recent press conference we heard uh, from the authorities and they said there is nothing which uh, proves, uh, indicates that this is a criminal investigation at this point, but of course they're going to keep their cards to themselves. That is the way it goes. We have followed many, many cases and we know that it is a very tricky situation for the investigators. They've got to keep things secret. If they do have a lead, they don't want that to get out for the perpetrator to get the upper hand. And so the way it is now, we're going to have to just wait and see what happens. But the most important thing right now is that they do keep searching for Sebastian. And luckily the weather is going to be getting warmer, but it is still quite cold and there will be a lot of rain. Uh, the area where he is, there's a lot of wilderness. I really don't see how he would get very far without shoes. If there's rough terrain, depending upon which location, which direction he might have gone. But this seems more that uh, he was taken away in a vehicle, is my sense of it. That is my own perception to this point. From everything that I've heard and seen, it just doesn't look good. Uh, as far as him having left, uh, she said that he went out the door. But if he'd gone out the door, I don't think he would have gone deep into the wilderness. I think he would have been seen on camera the next morning. He would have been seen somewhere on camera. And so, you know, how does a, how does a 15 year old autistic boy get so far away without being seen? That is quite perplexing. Uh, it's just that um, people are just not buying what these two have to say. I don't want to say anything against them because uh, at the same time, the boy is missing and we don't know that they are guilty. We don't know that they are, that they've done anything wrong. It could simply be he was maybe, as I heard from one of the professionals from Peter Hyatt, his analysis was that possibly he had been punished and, and told to go outside or left outside something along those lines and as opposed to that he'd been harmed so at this point we really don't know but let me know what you've all heard what is your opinion of this case and is there any hope that sebastian can be found who knows there could be a good ending we need to stay positive and wait and see what happens i know there is a search which is going to be happening with the Equus search team. They are an awesome team. Um, we've seen them on other cases. And so hopefully they can find something, anything, just to show that Sebastian had been there. And if it takes a turn for the worse, we will see uh, what comes of that as well. So I want to thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you very much for your comments. I look forward to reading what all of you have to say. And I hope this case can be solved very soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember to like, subscribe, and share. Bye for now.